Hello and welcome to another episode of Anomalies, a program about things that are just a little bit out of the ordinary. So I'm Dan Hall, one of your hosts, and with me is my buddy, uh, Gwen Farrell, who sometimes we get to have as a host, and we're fortunate to have her today. How are things in Arizona, Gwen? Okay? Wonderful, beautiful weather out today, sun shining, um, not too cold. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not 150 yet, anyway. So <laughs> not I'm, yet. <laughs> not yet. So I'm going to let you introduce our guest because uh, you were chiefly responsible for booking him on the show. So let's turn that introduction over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here um, and to help with this wonderful interview today. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about Richard Lang, who's a very distinguished member of the UFO community and has done some amazing things in his career and is still working in that area. So um, Richard is an FAA licensed commercial pilot with an instrument multi-engine rating and a Bachelor of Science degree in aeronautical studies from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida. Mr. Lang has enjoyed a successful career with more than 20 years in the corporate world as a senior vice president working in brokerage and the trust investment division of commercial banks. In the post 9-11 period, he temporarily left his banking career to serve as a special deputy with the U.S. Marshal Service. He worked for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security as a federal liaison, interfacing with airlines and airport authorities responsible for implementing federal procedures, dealing with regulatory initiatives associated with aviation's security and law enforcement agencies in Virginia that respond to airports and aviation emergencies. He was a member of the Anti-Terrorist Advisory Council Board, which was organized by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and frequently served as a key speaker on terrorism at quarterly regional meetings. He belonged to the UFO organization, MUFON, and completed training to become a certified field investigator. He was eventually appointed as chief investigator for both Virginia and North Carolina. He was one of the original six members of the MUFON star team and the first manager of that team. In 2009, Richard managed the Bass MUFON SIP SIP project, that was facilitated through Bigelow Aerospace and funded by the Defense Intelligence Agency. At that time, this was the most advanced funded rapid response UFO UAP investigative team in the world. He is the author of two books on the subject of UFO investigation, which are being used by organizations and state chapters to train people interested in UFO investigation. There are several chapters in these books about elevated states of human consciousness and multidimensional existences. And we'll be talking about those books a little bit later in the interview today. In 2008, Richard was showcased as the lead investigator in the Discovery Channel TV series, UFOs Over Earth, and later in Canada's Discovery Channel TV series, Close Encounters. He has been interviewed numerous times on podcasts and radio shows, as well as three times on Coast to Coast AM with George Knapp. Richard currently serves as the owner and editor of Lang Publication, a resource for self-publishing ebooks and printed editions since 2009. Richard, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to start, Dan? Sure. Um, so that's a very interesting background, some of which lends itself to uh, UFOs and some of it doesn't seem to be related at all. So I, I listened to the interview you did with Liz Velez, who uh, oh, yeah. um, Glenn and I know. As I recall, this kind of started for you when you had your own UFO sighting. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, Everybody okay. always asked me about, what, well, why, why are you doing this or what got you yeah. started? And basically, I mean, I was always interested in it, but um, when I was in Embry, when I was at Embry Riddle, um, I was I was finishing up my degree in aeronautics, and I was also in flight school there. And one night, I was flying up the coast of Florida by myself in a small, you know, like a single-engine high-performance airplane. 
And, and that's, you know, it's just a beautiful ride at night. If you're about a couple thousand feet and about a mile out over the water, you know, the lights from all the buildings, it's really a beautiful flight up there. So anyway, I'm flying up there. And um, what you normally do is you have your radio set to, um, your radio is always set to, bear with me one second here. My screen just died for a minute. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So um, you have your radio set. You're talking to the, the the controller from where you just left. And then you're also have the other radio set to the, the next destination. So you can hear what's going on. So I'm flying up the coast and I hear this radio traffic. These, this Eastern airline pilot calls in and basically says that um, he calls the air traffic controller and says, we've got traffic in our flight pattern. What that, what that means, there's something else in their way on the way they're going. And the controller comes back and says, oh, no, uh, negative radar contact. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, th th this goes on for a couple more minutes. Of course, you know, my ears are perked up and I'm, you know, getting all excited. And it was way out over the ocean. I couldn't see it. But so the guy calls back again and goes, look, we've got traffic in our flight path. And um, the guy, got, the, the controller goes, uh, uh, negative radar contact, you know. <laughs> and so you could tell these guys are getting mad. You know, and um, so so finally the guy calls back the third time and he goes, look, we have a visual on traffic um, in our flight path. It's huge. It's unconventional. It's uh, hovering over the ocean and it's got multicolored lights on it. And and so then another pilot who's in like a small business jet calls in and goes, um, we've got a visual on the same object as Eastern does. And, and so the, that, you know, they basically the back that, you know, the controllers aren't going to admit that there's something out there. So I was going to Jacksonville when I get up there, I was going to land and then come back to Daytona. Well, I get to Jacksonville and they're like, I call in to land and they're like, um, maintain holding for departing military traffic. And they have like that, that time they had two runways that were kind of like this. These two fighter jets come screaming off the runway, go out over the ocean you can hear them blowing through the sound barrier. They're going supersonic, all lit up with afterburners. And they went right out to where those guys were. Sorry about that. They went right out to where those guys were um, seeing that, uh, you know, seeing that object. So, you know, basically what I learned that night was that, first of all, there was something out there that was seen by a couple of, uh, you know, uh, different jet pilots, basically that the air traffic controllers wouldn't admit it, but then they dispatched fighter jets out to check it out, which made me know they really did see it. So that's how I got started. Very interesting. <laughs> did interesting. you share, share with anybody that you had a UFO experience? Say what again? Did you share with anybody that you had a UFO experience after that, or did you kind of keep mum about that? Sometimes. People no, I wrote about it in both my books. No, it's okay. no, I mean, it's not a secret or anything. Okay. But a lot of people will ask me, um, you know, like, have you ever been abducted or are you a contactee? And, you know, basically, I, I'm an investigator and a researcher, okay? And and I always, you know, if I'm in a meeting, somebody's sure to ask me that. And, I, and I'll say, well, you know, that's like asking a police homicide investigator if you ever murdered anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where it's at, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed a lot of people, obviously, and I have pretty good insight. A lot of what I know and feel about what's going on with ETs comes from people that I've interviewed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you have uh, written and spoken about the experience that you had when you were a manager of the MUFON STAR team and working yeah. with the Bass SIP program. Yeah. Um, what I'm interested in there is I'm sure you must have had some amazing cases. Um, and I'm, I know you've probably talked about these too, but I'm sure yeah. our readers and our listeners would like to know um, if you could share with us what you think was one of the most influential ones or um, most interesting ones. Well, there were a lot of them. Basically what we were doing is we had a team of people. There were 12 people. They called them dispatchers. And at that time, MUFON's database, we had about 800 reports that would come in every month. And so when the reports would come in, these guys would go through those reports and essentially, you know, vet through them with criteria that we set up for them. And um, out of 800 cases, they'd maybe find about 35 to 50 of them that were like really good ones. And so at that point, then I would send people out 
to investigate them. We had a network. We had about 50 people signed up to investigate, and they all got paid and all that. And they wanted to go out and investigate the case and write a report and send me the narrative from the witnesses and all that. I'd put that together in a report format, send it to Bigelow, who we now know sent it on to the Pentagon. So the kind of cases that we were looking for, um, that whole program was designed more directed towards propulsion, okay? So if, if somebody sent something in about a cattle mutilation or something about an abductee, um, they weren't really that interested in that. What they were looking for was cases where you had craft that got in close proximity to the ground where maybe it went over a building and you know it and the hva system went out when it went over or the burglar alarms are going off the automatic light systems are going off that kind of thing so they wanted things where there was cases where there was close proximity to some kind of objects houses buildings whatever and then try to find anything that you know might be like electrical disturbances or any kind of uh, you know physiological things that might happen to somebody or something like that. So if in in looking back at those cases, um, there was one case that we worked that was um, so some airline pilot, an airline pilot, and uh, the whole flight crew. They were in um, Houston and they were taxing out to take off, and they see this huge object out, like what they the outer marker would be like five miles out. And, you know, when you come into land, you cross the outer mark, we know you're in five miles. To, and then the inner marker is like near the fence. So these guys are looking out towards, you know, five miles out and they see this huge object. It's got very intimate detail on it. And, and it appears to be approaching the airport. And, um, and there, was, there was two of them in the cockpit. And um, then it just disappears. And then maybe 30 seconds later, it reappears and now it's closer, you know, and, and they gave us kind of a lot of really cool detail about that. And because there was two people there, we published the case. We did change, we did change the, the times of the departure times of the flight because we didn't want the pilots to get in trouble for telling us, you know, but um, there was um, probably one of the best cases that we worked was a case up in uh Port Jarvis, New York. And essentially what that one was, was um, we had a, a guy that was um, a nurse practitioner in a psychiatric facility. And the guy's driving home one night and um, he sees this light, you know, and he's, it's like a windy country road. He's on his way home, you know? So he sees the light and then he comes down the valley, comes up over the next one. He sees now lights getting a little closer, you know, and up and now it's getting real close. And so finally he pulls off the road near this pasture and, and he's watching this thing and, and it, and it gets real close and it comes right over top of his vehicle. And, and when that happens, everything in the car goes out. It, like the you know the headlights are out the dash lights are out the radio he said he you know he was listening to christmas music he's right on christmas and he was listening to christmas music and all of a sudden boom the radio's off the lights are out the the dash lights are out the phone's dead and he's sitting there in the dark and um you know he's looking up and this thing kind of looked like a big um it was kind of dollar bill shaped because he could only see the bottom of it and it had lights on it it was rotating like a fan blade would hmm. And, and so he's, he, first he was curious and then now he, you know, he's, he's starting to get scared. Mm -hmm. And so he, he told me, you know, should, should I get out of the car? Should I, should I stay in the car? Should I run? You know? And um, so he was trying to get the door open and everything in the car, the, all the electrical systems in the car were dead. The electric locks, nothing would work. Windows won't work anything. So he finally got the door open. He's still sitting there with a the seatbelt on and he goes like, you know, and he looks up at it. And when he does that, the thing, gone i said did it did the lights go out or did it fly away or what and he goes i don't know i i just as soon as it left the, the car came back on and i just got the hell out of there as fast as i could he said he went through every red light and stop sign on the way home he was scared to death so when you get a case like that it's it's a great story but then what we did we sent investigators up to interview him and when the investigator went up there he had a brand new mitsubishi a sedan an investigator goes out to check the car out. He put his hand out. He said, when you get your hand eight or 10 inches away from the car, 
you could feel a static cling. Like, you know how when you open a cleaner bag with a wool sweater in it, he said, you could feel that from eight, 10 feet away, real strong, staticky cling. So we did, we did tests on the car and, and it had a really strong magnetic field around it. You know, we tested it with instruments. And also one of the things, you know, I've written, I've showed in my book how you do it, but basically you use a compass needle, you get away from the car, the compass points north. And then when you get to the, then the, the needle points to where the magnetic field is. And it, and it had a really strong magnetic field around it, which was real interesting. And so um, he interviewed the guy. And um, wh one of the things that, that we were, I wasn't really sure about is he said when the thing went away, the, the car came back on. You know, the lights are back on. It can hear the music again. His phone's back on. And um, so I, there was something about that just didn't ring, you know, that I was thinking about. So I flew back up there and interviewed the guy myself. And, and I said, okay, now when, you, when your car came back on, what, you heard the motor start up again. And he goes, no. I said, you know how when you turn the key, it's eh, and it starts up. He goes, yeah, but that's not what happened. I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, when, when everything, everything came back on, and he said the motor didn't start, it was just running again. And, and he said it, it would be like if you were watching a movie and you pushed the pause button and then you pushed the play button. The motor didn't start. It was just running again. Hmm. And that's really significant because it sort of lends itself to the exploration of like time dilation and stuff like that, which is what we think probably happens. Hmm. There was been four or five cases that, that the, the old guys, the NICAP guys and that, that had, had experienced that. And they called me and talked to me. There's only been four or five cases like that, but they were all like that where the, the motors didn't start. They just were running and stuff like that. So that's probably one of the most interesting, uh, most interesting cases that we did. The other thing with the, the start, and I'll, one more and I'll, the, one of the things, the advantage we had, because basically, you know, like is MUFON is oriented by states. So if a case comes in, whichever state directors in that state sees the case. Well, our team was looking at the whole country. So what would happen is like one night, this red orb pops up around Philadelphia somewhere, you know, now it's coming across the country and they're seeing it in Ohio, you know, and it goes, it eventually goes all the way across the country. And, and because they were looking at the whole thing, you know, there's like 13 or 14 reports popping up is it's moving across the country. So the advantage there was being able to look at like the whole Northern hemisphere at the same time. And there's some really interesting data that we got from that kind of stuff. Um, I can imagine that you did. And I, it sounds like um, it was an amazing effort. Um, the time that was put into it, um, MUFON was very serious about it. And yep. you guys worked really hard to make sure that what you were, what you were getting was, um, these were very important cases. So um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing those. Um, I wanted to ask you, did you find through all of those cases that you looked at, that they had similar um, evidence, physical evidence, or um, what you'd consider physical evidence, I guess, uh, that was kind of in common among the two? Or did you, did you find that there was a lot of diff differences in that? Well, it depends on the type of case you're looking for. The kind of cases that we were looking at, there was typically a lot of physical evidence. You know, uh, security guards working at night, this thing slides over the, the complex and then all of a sudden all the automatic lights are going off and on or the burglar alarms are going off. You know, anytime there's an effect on the ground, that's really good, good evidence because it's just more than somebody seeing a light in the sky. You see what I'm saying? So the kind of cases we're working, yeah, we, we saw a lot of physical evidence. And then as far as like, I've done a lot of research with, with, with abduction and I've interviewed a lot of abductees over the last 30 years or so. And I think that's the thing that probably pulls the, you know, that validates what the people are telling you, because I mean, I'll be honest, when I first started, you know, I'm out of flight school, I've got a degree in aeronautics, which is all science and physics, and you're sitting there in somebody's living room, and they're telling you about being abducted. And you're going, you know, uh, I, I need to get the hell out of here. You know, you just like, you can't believe it. And then you go interview another one, and another one, another one, pretty soon, you're like, 
you know what? These guys are telling the truth because they're all telling the same thing. They don't know each other, but all the little details about what they're saying are all the same. And so then you start getting in this mindset where now you're starting to basically your perception of reality changes. So you start to explore that kind of stuff, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yes, and, it does. Mm -hmm. And the thing, I think the thing that motivated me to write the first book, the book's called the um, UFO Investigation. It's the methodology of a new age. And the reason that I wrote it is because if you look at these guys that have been doing this stuff for, for 30, 40 years, um, it's basically all the same game. You know, the report comes, they run out, they've got their cameras, their magnetometers, their electric instronic instruments, you know, the, the, the instrumentation is a lot better because it's all digital and more accurate than it used to be, you know, but there's more to it than that part. And, you know, when you, when in, in the book, I explored a lot about what they call the non-physical elements, the multidimensional type stuff which is if you really want to get into this is that that's where you got to go because these things, you know, I mean, they just defy the laws of physics. And, and, and I think a lot of guys, um, you know, people tend to write reports based on their own perception of reality. Per example, um, you've got a, 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 a couple or individual, whoever, and they've got a car parked and, and they're saying they see this object and they're telling you it came right down through the forest, through the trees. It went right through a chain link steel fence and landed next to their car. Okay. So the, the investigator goes out, interviews them. And then, you know, when he's done, he writes his report up and he says that the craft flew over the trees, flew over the fence and landed next to the car. So what you've done is you basically corrupted your database with inaccurate information. Just because if you don't believe it, you still write what they tell you instead of what you don't, you know, you don't run it through your filter of reality. You see what I'm saying? And so in that respect, a lot of the database that's been accumulated over the last 50 years, th there's a lot of those kind of mistakes that have been made in, in reporting stuff because they can't, they can't deal with, they, they don't understand what multidimensional consciousness is or multidimensional realities are. And so in the book, I've taken a lot of time to try to explain, you know, different the, the, how dimensions, as you get up in higher dimensions, um, the frequency changes. And basically, um, the higher the frequency, the lower the density. And people are like, what do you mean by that? And it's like, really simple example. You take ice. And, and you heat it up. When you heat something up, you're basically increasing the frequency or the energy. And when you heat the ice up, it turns to water, changes the state. Ice is denser than water is. And then if you keep going and heat the water up, it turns to steam. And steam, water is denser than steam is. So what happens as you increase the frequency, the density of whatever it is changes. And so I think when you hear people like, talking about something going through a chain link fence or something that's that you know somebody's abducted and they take them out through the roof of their 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 bedroom what they've done is they've increased that person's frequency to a point where the the they're at a, a much higher level and the density's low enough you can go through the wall i know it sounds insane but i think that's probably how it works and um what it, it's almost like when you're trying to help people understand what di dimensional consciousness is, is, I mean, the, there's so much that's been done. Like when I took physics back in the late seventies, you know, and now you've, you've got like trans, um, you know, you've, you've got uh, quantum physics and trans dimensional physics, you know, these, these quantum physicists are already figuring this stuff out. Half the people are totally clueless about it. But if you look at the CERN project, you know, the, the particle accelerator in France and Switzerland, I think, you know, it's like this big thing that's underground. It's like an eight mile oval that's down underground. And basically what they do is they, they create these magnetic fields in there that accelerate the particles. And um, what, what, you know, they'll tell you that they've identified 12 dimensional existences outside this time space reality. And so people say, how, how's that possible? Well, it's kind of like, it's all about frequency. So if you have someone, 
like say you're watching the easiest example I can give is if you're watching the TV, you turn it to this channel and you're on a certain frequency, you can see this program. You turn it to another channel, you change the frequency. Now you're watching a different program the, and, and, you know, work through that. But the bottom line is that all those channels and all that stuff exists simultaneously. It's just whichever frequency you're tuned to is the one that you can perceive, if that makes sense. And, and so, you know, that's kind of like these people when they're have these encounters, I think, you know, some of them, there's a lot of things that happen to them, but a lot of them, you know, they're, they're, they've changed, you know, they, they, some of them can heal, some of them are psychic, you know, they can communicate telepathically and that kind of stuff. Am I okay? Am I going off the deep end here with you? Are you all right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's kind of what anomalies is about. Okay. Yeah. We go okay. to the deep end um, with people that who are who are really knowledgeable. So we appreciate that. And I certainly agree with your efforts that you're doing and congratulate you on doing that because I recall when I was a field investigator many years ago, um, what our training was and these things that we did not look at. And some of us um, left to go into other fields or a little closer to what you're talking yeah. about. So yeah. I appreciate the fact that you are, um, that you're doing that work. Um, and so I'd like to turn the questioning over to Dan now, if he has something he'd like to talk about. I don't know if you want to go here, uh, Richard, but I'm very fascinated by Robert Bigelow. And uh, my uh, exposure to him, my first exposure to him was the Skinwalker Ranch and okay. the National Institute of Discovery Science. So what kind of insights can you share about Bigelow, what his agenda is, whether he's been good for uh, the field? Yeah, just talk about him to the degree. Well, I mean, the, when I worked on that project, I didn't have day-to-day -day contact with Bigelow. There was a guy named Colm Kelleher which a lot of people know who he is. He ran the program and there were some other guys and I talked to them, you know, every day. And, um, uh, the, the, uh, Bigelow, I mean, I can't really speak for him, but I can tell you, he's been privily public about what he thinks and what he's doing. He's dumped a lot of money into this research. You know, I think he did a remember last year, he did an interview on 60 minutes and, yes. you know, he basically said there were, you know, he just laid it out for, yeah, there were ETs are real, you know, and, um, but um, I've not really done much with him. George Knapp's pretty tight with him and George has interviewed him a number of times. Um, they've talked about the ranch and they've talked about the, the you know, the, what do you call it? The uh, hitchhikers and all that kind of stuff. The ranch is really interesting place. Very uh, well, when I worked on the project, I had not read the, the, the hunt for the skinwalker, the book that George Knapp and Colum wrote. And um, if I would have read that before I knew those guys, I would have had a hard time believing some of it. But after I worked with them and, and I've worked some with I know George pretty good, too. George has been real good to me, interviewing me and stuff like that. But I think Knapp is probably one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet about he really knows a lot about what's going on. Um, but, um, the, the, well, knowing those guys and then going and reading the book afterwards, is like, man, you know, it really opens up a lot of like really creepy stuff. And I mean, I, I tell you privately, some of those guys would tell you that, that, that place where they hated it because it was so creepy. They couldn't, you know, yeah. um, but, um, the, and, and see that the thing is, is we didn't know. I probably could have gone to the ranch if I'd have asked them, but I was so busy. I didn't want to have time, even if I, I wanted to. And, um, you know, um, the, the, um, I know some people from MUFON went out there one time, try to get in there and the security people lit them up and kicked them out, you know, mm -hmm. but, and then the bass guys are calling me going, what's going on? You know, I'm like, I didn't know, but they were kind of, they were kind of mad because they, they should have asked if they wanted to do that and they didn't. And, um, uh, you know, so, so it, it, but it, it was a pretty highly secured place and there's a lot of like multi-dimensional portals there and a lot of really creepy stuff going on there. So the thing is, is that when, when they wrote the book, Skinwalker to Pentagon, you guys have read that one, right? You know about that book. Yeah. And so that book. I mean, I was real, they were real nice to me in that book because they basically said all those reports I were writing and sending to Bass every week, 
the, the, the guys up in the Pentagon were reading them every day and they named me and said, I did a good job and all that. So I'll be eternally grateful for that. Um, but some of the stuff about the, uh, the paranormal stuff, I really wasn't that up to is up to speed on it as I'm, I'm getting now. But I think that one of the, you know, my first book, I'm going to read, I'm going to re, what do you call it? Rewrite it or revise it or whatever. Revise. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And make it more of a, a guide. It's going to be a guide for the next book will be a guide for UFO investigation. There won't, the chapters about bass and all that will be gone because, you know, I already reiterated all that in the first book, but I want to put a lot more energy into the equipment and the technology and the methodology used to fit to to detect and, and deal with the paranormal aspects. And also, one of the things I think that, you know, we didn't do uh, in my first book, you know, like I went soup to nuts, you know, here's how you photograph them, here's how you interview them, here's all the what all the things can happen, and blah, blah, blah. And here's how you write the reports at the end. But I didn't say anything about now wait six months and go back and interview those people again and see if there's any paranormal stuff you know, any wine bottles flying around in their apartment or something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. One of the, the, the things that, I, that the, you know, the, the people that were involved in that first round, um, there were three of them. They were all like, um, uh, DIA, but they were all like special forces people and had serious experience, you know, pretty, pretty tough guys, including one of them, which is a woman. And, um, the, the lady was back in, um, she lives up here in Northern Virginia somewhere. I guess she's sitting there with her boyfriend and they're having dinner and a wine bottle comes out of the wine rack over here, comes flying right across the table and smashes up against a wall on the other side of the apartment. You know, and I'm just like, man, that would definitely ruin your day. It ruined your dinner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I mean, those people, the, the thing is, is those people are of such high caliber that you gotta, they, they don't, these people don't make crap like that up. You know what I'm saying? They're serious operators. And so when, you know, it's just that that's the thing I think that that the more I, I hear about this, the more I'm hearing that people that are, you know, have had UFO experiences or con their contactees, they get this paranormal stuff going on in the house and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, since you are definitely still very much involved in this field and um, you're you're moving things forward in what I Brian. consider to be a, a, um, a very enlightened way. Um, I wanted to ask you, we've talked about MUFON a little. Both of us have had relationships with MUFON. We all have, I guess, to a certain degree. And MUFON has really uh, changed in the last couple of years in many no, ways. No, you're kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who knows, they uh, have become much more out in the public eye and have yeah. been reaching out to our government to see about and you know how they can help with new things so yeah. this is a bit controversial within the ufo community and as someone who's been around and seen a lot i'd like to ask you what's your opinion um about about that i'll just stop right there oh man now you're gonna you just threw me <laughs> under the bus didn't you <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, okay, when I'm not sure what I'm, what, do you, what are you asking me? You want me to tell you why I think they're going or what's going on or what? No, I I guess I just. I mean, would I know. Like to I'll know. tell you. I guess, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, um, you can. That would be wonderful. But also, I'm I'm just more interested in what your personal opinion is, having been in the field so long and having to see how this whole thing has moved through all of these years. Do you feel like we're moving and MUFON's moving kind of in a beneficial or good way? Are you still on, are you on the fence about that or what would you say? Okay. Uh, first of all, I don't have any official involvement. I don't have any uh, involvement with MUFON as far as running anything or doing anything. I'm, um, I'm a benefactor. I'm a life member and that's it. Um, so I think what, what, here's what, where the controversy is. Okay. Um, they're, 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 um, I think McDonald came out a couple of journal issues ago and said something to the effect that, you know, that they'd been working with government agencies for 20 years. Yes. Okay. Now I'm, and, and I think he said they get 12, thousand reports a month which which isn't right either but um 
the basically, I don't think that they have been working with government agencies. Uh, in, 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 wait a minute, I'll tell you what I mean. When we did the Bass project, basically what happened is Bass and MUFON made a contract. And what they were doing is they were paying us $57,000 a month to, 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 for us to get this information together and give it to them. And when we did that, the deal was that, you know, they're a proprietary organization. And once I send them case information, if they send some guys out and interview somebody or have doctors examine them and all the other things that they would might do, they didn't have to come back and tell me what they learned. They paid me for the information and then what they used it for and what they learned was their proprietary information. That was really spelled out real directly and specifically in the contract we had. So there was people, you know, that would get on these talk shows and, and da, 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 about all the, you know, the conspiracy stuff. And, um, uh, you know, the, there really wasn't any in that regard because I ran it and I was the only one that was from MUFON. It was a lot of talk to those guys. And, you know, my experience with them was that they were very straight up. They did exactly what we agreed to their government. They, you know, their government, they were financed by a government agency. They got contracts and they do exactly what they're supposed to do. And they did. Um, so, so I want to take Richard back under the bus here for a second. Go ahead. I've been, been there a was, bunch of times. Trust yeah, me. I, bet you have. I, bet I know, you have. I'm, you know, I know all about it. Go ahead. <laughs> I know my way around into the bus. Let's put it uh, that way. <laughs> Uh, I've actually the, slithered out of there a few times too, but go ahead. One of the things I heard when I was in MUFON, which was a criticism of what uh, Bigelow was doing, I'm kind of fascinated with Bigelow for some reason, was that Bigelow's uh, desire to get information from MUFON and pay for it uh, was um, a violation of the confidentiality uh, piece about people who reported to, to MUFON and said, you know, hey, I'm giving you my information with strict confidence. So maybe address that. A bit. I can tell you all about that. Okay. When we first started the program, um, when I was dealing with the guys at Bass, you know how when you go on to the MUFON CMS and you file a report, you guys have seen them. So what was done was that... Um, we put in there, like right after you put your name and stuff, there was a question and it came up and it said, are you agreeable to having your information shared with third parties? Like, I'm not, I can't remember if it said Bass or Bigelow. It, it wouldn't have said Bigelow, it might have said Bass. Are you comfortable having your information shared with third parties like Bass? And if you checked yes, then they could see the case and we could give them case information. If they checked no, then their case would be blocked out from their access they had. They had, they had like the investigators do, they had, you know, the, the access codes to get in CMS and all that. So if somebody put no, then they, they blocked them. They couldn't see that person's report. So that's not true. Um, well, and let me think, I think Elaine Douglas, if you guys remember her, she was one of the ones that really got on these radio shows. And I mean, I knew L Elaine and I talked to her. I said, Elaine, this is bullshit what you're telling. And it, this did not happen. And then she'd get on Jerry Pippen's show and go on and on about all the blah, 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 you know, that was happening. Um, but when I run it, it, I mean, we did what, exactly what we said we were going to do in, in the, um, you know, and that's how the data was protected. The big thing with the MUFON membership at large was a lot of people were thinking when Bigelow, you know, when Bass went out and they investigated something, that they found a lot of really interesting stuff that they, they should tell MUFON members what they found. And that wasn't how it worked. Every case that we did, I wrote an article in the, um, every case that we worked, we had a confidentiality agreement that we all signed. And at the bottom of the confidentiality agreement, right before where you put your signature, it said that during the times when these cases were being investigated, it was proprietary, it was confidential. And that once the case was finished and the report was written up in the MUFON journal, 
then the information becomes public information. Okay. So once I wrote every month, I'd write a report about, you know, all the cases and a little bit about each one. And once I did that, then they were public information that, that anybody could use them. I, I sometimes were redacted names and stuff like that, just so people weren't, you know, but that's basically how, does that answer your question or make you feel any better or not? No, no, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the other thing I think that's going on with MUFON is that um, in, in, you know, they, they might not, well, I've already said it in my book, so they, you know, whatever they wanted to do about it, they could have done about it. But basically I think that what's going on is if you really look back in history and I wrote about this in my book, that, that, you know, the, the, the uh, Project Blue Book ended at the exact same time MUFON started. Exactly. And so was this a way for the, these guys behind the curtain, instead of sneaking around and, you know, going to the post office and getting people's mail and going to the drugstore and, and stealing their, their pictures and all that, this was much easier and much more efficient way to follow up on the UFO investigators, because basically the people go online, they file a report, everything's in there, the pictures, the whole nine yards. Okay. And so I've always thought that probably that there was somebody behind that in the background that had access to that information. I'm pretty sure that somebody does. And by somebody, I mean, you know, the, the agency and if, you know, I'm smart enough not to say it on here, but I have a pretty agency. good idea who it is, but you know, you know yeah, I'll tell you that the, most of the stuff in my research, as far as people being, you know, discredited and debunked, most all of that came from CIA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I think that they probably, there's probably a back door in there. And, and the, the good news and the bad news is that um, it, the, it, they've created this inc really incredible database and the people that move on and the investigators have access to it. And that's, that's a big deal. It's a huge benefit. So you got to ask yourself, you know, if I get to look at these cases and work on these cases and do all this stuff, if somebody behind the curtain can see this, does, does how much does, what does it matter as long as I get to do what I want? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and, you know, I've gone around with them about that you know, like who, who's paying for this, all the servers and stuff like that. And nobody can seem to be able to answer that question, but um, that's, you know, I think now what's going on is, um, you know, the, I think that, you know, a lot of people out there when Dave McDonald says we've been contracting with, with government agencies for, for decades is what he said. Um, a lot of people are wondering what he's doing, you know, what he's doing in Washington all the time. You know, and and um, the uh, the there's a you know I, you guys know about the lobbying and all that stuff, right? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. A ten, you know, and um, that you know they've done a lot of lobbying, trying to get meetings with congressmen and stuff like that, and all that's good. You know, the more you can get these guys thinking about this and worrying about it, it's all good. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but um, the, uh, the the only thing that it might I think a lot of people think that they're making some kind of deal with one of the agencies to, to somehow sell a database or something like that. The only thing I can say about that, when we did it with Bigelow, everything was above board and everything was disclosed, you know? And um, if, if that happens again, I, I would hope that they would be honest with their members and tell them that. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, as you probably know, Carrie Ling Teal, um, Keel is um, on the board of directors and director of membership, I think, for MUFON. And she recently stated that MUFON has recently been nominated to be the new civilian component um, to the currently developing UAP panel, which is a very big deal uh, for MUFON, but also for people who are interested in this and people who are, are involved in this field. So um, when you say we'll that, is that, the, is that the thing that they put in the journal or is this something that just came out? Like um, that was on United MUFON. She hosts Carrie Ling, 
Ling Keel host United MUFON, which is their podcast that's done every month. And I believe that was the last month podcast. I can't tell you what day it's out. I usually catch it after the fact, but she did make that statement and um, it, it's very exciting. So what, when, I, I was read that to me again. Okay. There's a podcast that MUFON uh, does called. No, no, no. I mean what she said. Oh, she said, and I copied this down because I didn't want to yeah. get it wrong. Yeah, she said, um, let's see, MUFON has recently been nominated to be the new civilian component of the currently developing UAP panel. Um, and, and she made that statement after the board of directors came back from a visit a month or so ago. Um, and um, interesting. Well, what do news. they mean by the UAP panel? I'm not sure um, you would need to, maybe if you take a look at that, she may explain a little bit more if you take a look at that. that um, um, See, I think that, right now that the arrow that, you know, that that, that acronym is that they're, they're an official agency, they're just getting started. Yes. And um, then uh, Enigma Labs is a, is a player yes. in all that too. Um, right now, both of those groups are basically assimilating data. They, neither one of them are investigating anything. I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that, you know, they're that basically makes... collecting data. Um, I'm not saying that someday they might not hire people to, to do that, but I, I don't think they're there yet, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so the, the guy that's running arrow, I think he just got appointed very recently. So they even got their hands, you know, they haven't had time to get their hands around it, but um, I don't know what capacity MUFON's in. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they've been up there meeting a lot with, um, uh, congressmen and stuff and 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 it does appear that a lot of people in congress are starting to get real serious about finding out what's really going on with ufos and i didn't watch a lot of it but you know they had those television hearings this past summer yes congress and you know the the guys from the pentagon were just talking in circles and 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 those guys were getting mad i mean they knew they were being being played and and they didn't like it you know so we'll we'll see, but I I think anything you do in that area to get stirred up in Congress is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I agree with you. I think those hearings were very helpful, even though they might have been frustrating in some ways. Um, they were very helpful, and hopefully they'll they'll that openness will continue. So um, I think I have one final question, but I kind of want to shift gears here. Go ahead. Uh, and um, in your experience. Have you had experience personally or worked in the field of what we uh, typically call remote viewing? Do you have any feel or knowledge about where that is going um, developmental wise these days? Well, there's nothing new about remote viewing. Right. They, they've been doing basically um, one of the, the, you know, again, in Charlottesville, there's a place called the Monroe Institute. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you've heard of that or not. I've been there a little bit on some weekend stuff. And I think at some point I'd like to maybe go and spend the week there and, and get into that more. But basically um, they have a technology that they've developed. It's called Hemisync. And, and years ago, um, back, I'd say sometime late seventies or something like that. And they're really building that place up. Um, they, they did a lot of research where they had people that could do out of body type stuff. And what they did is they, you know, put the encephalograms on their heads and looked at their alpha waves when they were in those states and basically came up with this technology where they play sound waves in their ears, one in this ear and one in this ear, different ones. And, and they figured out how to use that to synchronize your alpha brain waves. And, and that helps you get into that out of body state as opposed to doing 20 years of transcendental meditation. So they've got some pretty cool stuff going on up there. There are people that work and do remote viewing. Um, when I was in, um, you know, uh, during the, my time at TSA and, and we, we, we had offices in Charlottesville. And so the Charlottesville airport was one of the closest ones, you know, you know, we were close there and, and, and I'd be there a lot. I was actually working there in uniform as it, you know, in law enforcement for a little while. And then before, and I ended up going to work for the government, but um, it was kind of cool because people would come through there and the screeners would be screening their luggage and they'd find these spoons and forks that are all bent up in there. <laughs> and um, it, it, they, they pull them out of the luggage 
and then the person's there, you know, and, and like at the time I was, you know, suit, but I had my federal credentials around my neck. And it's kind of fun because I'd walk up and say, oh, I see you've been to the Monroe Institute. And the person's <laughs> like, oh, my God, how do the feds know I was there, you know? And then I'm like, because I've been there, too. <laughs> and then like, oh, OK. <laughs> and um, they have uh, they have that uh, a place up there where there's a, like a trophy case. And they have a whole bunch of those spoons and forks that are all all bent up. And um, uh, they, they do some some really cool stuff there. Um, I remember. Um, that, you, you know, and I mean, it goes back to kind of what I'm saying in the book, when you're trying to develop these kind of things, the, 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 the census, everybody has the, we have capability, we're much more powerful mentally and spiritually than we think we are, because what happens when you're a kid, you know, your parents condition you, you know, church, Sunday school, elementary school, by the time you're seven or eight years old, you're pretty much wired together what you think's right and wrong and what your perception of reality is and so i was talking to this couple that were taking a class up there and they were like my age and they were trying to learn how to do the thing with the spoons and bend the spoons and it's incredibly hard to do and the reason it's so hard to do is because you've got 60 years of of knowing it's impossible mm -hmm. yeah. so they they bring this four-year-old kid in there and he can do it in four minutes <laughs> and the reason why is because he don't he has he don't know it's impossible yet. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you know, there's so much about that that's going. Um, the remote viewing thing is they've been that's what the originally I think the Monroe Institute was built for. It was the like the the the, the agent mostly the CIA. They they put most of the funding in that, and that's what they were doing is training people to do remote viewing. That's back in the 70s. So yeah, um, the, there's there's some real interesting stuff about that you know yes. yeah, i agree and, well, we've had people on the program who are very interesting who talk to us about that yeah and there's some people who can do it pretty good pretty good too mm -hmm. and then i've i'm well i'm right but like i know somebody that's practiced that but they also said that you can if somebody's remote viewing you and you've if, if you know what's going on sometimes you can see like a shadowy shadowy something in around mm -hmm. you where they're actually part of their their presence is somehow detectable or something. The animals will will do it too. They'll like if, say you're, I mean, you're sneaking into somebody's, you know, bedroom or something, and and the dog will usually react to it because mm -hmm. they can sense something's going on, which is even makes it even more interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that Absolutely. answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Dan. Before we finish today, we do want to talk about your books, and maybe you oh, can show you. us those books. Oh, yeah, but, hold on. Yeah, Dan, if you want to do, do maybe a question to close. Or... I'll put my background on so you can see my books. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, wonderful. do that. Do that um, first, then I'll ask my question. Yeah, there you go. Um, those are the two books that are available right now. The, 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 the website, Lang Publication, Dot com. If you go on there, there's you can click and it'll take you links to get them on. Am they're on Amazon and they're available. And then this is the book that I'm working on that's going to be out in two weeks. And that's the one that's uh, geared for first responders and, um, you know, police. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonder interesting. Yeah, thank you. So I'm just yeah. go ahead. You were going to ask me something or say something. Well, I think Dan, I, I was going to ask one last speculative uh -huh. question. Um, yeah. You've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Who's coming here? What? what? What kind of intelligences are coming to Earth? And if they have an agenda or multiple agendas, what's okay. your speculation about what those are? Well, the, the first of all, the answer to the question is, that there's probably at least a half a dozen species that come here and um, they all have different agendas. And I, I mean, that's sort of like, you can tell, I mean, there's different types of craft that come, you know, boomerangs, triangles, saucers, um, probably less known, but, but very prevalent is these huge ones, you know, something that's as big as a strip mall shopping center. And um, I think, in general, I think the agenda is, and, and 
you know how things develop and you you get somehow you 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 figure something out but here here's one of the big things if you look back in the truman administration you know when they're they're like detonating all these atomic bombs and then they go and they blow up two japanese cities and kill a bunch of people there was a really heavy influx of um ufo activity and at the same time a lot of the saucer type crafts i wrote about the propulsion electrogravitic propulsion excuse me one second sorry um i wrote about it in my um uh, in my book um the um the nuclear stuff is a big problem okay and um you know at the same time you know they were using a lot of that really powerful anti-aircraft radar to prevent another pearl harbor type scenario and a lot of the crashes were because that radar interferes with the electrogravitic propulsion and um that caused some to crash probably between Truman and Eisenhower they recovered a more than a dozen of those with bodies and all and so you know what they were doing is they took turned it over to like like these um um technology companies and defense contractors and they wanted them to do the back engineering and they made deals with them let them keep patent rights and all that kind of stuff so so a lot of this research and technology is being done in in proprietary just like with, with bass and but I think the thing is is that if you look at quantum physics now you know physics that's developed since the atomic bomb age they can clearly tell you that when you detonate an atomic weapon it trans outside it transcends outside our three-dimensional time space reality and it goes into other dimensions and it disrupts the fabric of space and you know from a galactic perspective it's causing problems and they're they don't like that because it's really dangerous it's like it's like you know monkeys playing with hand grenades <laughs> from their perspective you know what I'm saying and and I think there's a lot of energy that like a lot of the contact you guys deal with contactees probably more than I do now but a lot of these people are telling you they're saying you know we're wrecking the planet you know you got to quit using nuclear weapons you got to quit polluting and that's the kind of stuff that they're trying to instill in people that are having contact right now so you know again it, 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 if you interview contactees and you can tell what the aliens are up to because the, they'll they'll tell you you know what's been laid out for them but you know I, I personally don't think that it's a real hostile agenda out there you know people say well they're dangerous well if they were they've got technologies a thousand years ahead of us we'd be gone already so I don't think I don't I think they're more benevolent in terms of they just like to see us go up to higher octaves of consciousness and so we become socially responsible the the problem is our social consciousness is is not as high as our technology is which yeah. makes us dangerous Mm -hmm. so you know the the whole evolution of human consciousness I think some of that has to be somehow somehow I think some of that's being um it's being done for the you know the the, the 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 there's energy out there conscious energy out there that's pushing that and I think that's where we got to go instead of blowing up cities and stuff like that and and and, and you know I'm sure when they're looking at that you know if, if if you were one of them and you're flying around the planet and they're like look down there they just blow up that city you know and now look they killed all those people over there you know they're like these aren't nice people you know but the problem is is most of us are nice people you know I mean take it talk to any American ask him if he thinks it's a good idea for them to be going over there tearing up the, the Ukraine and most people are going to say they don't like it you mm -hmm. know but you know you've got you've got governments and you've got a lot of like you know your deep state and they're stirring all this crap up they also have control of all the technology which is a, a, a big problem but you know the average people they're not that you know I mean most people would be real like somebody said one time not there's been a bunch of people that have said this but they said something to the effect if they try to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine the ETs are going to come take them all all of them even the ones in space and and I'm thinking you know what I'm good with that that that'd be, oh, yeah. I'd be fine with that 
<laughs> yep. Yep. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. so it's, you know, taking the hand grenades away from the monkeys, you know, and and then and, and I'm not. I mean, that'd be that's a really nice thought if they do it. Yeah. Well, Richard, I'd like to once again echo Gwen and say thanks for being on with us. Thank you. Uh, Thank well, you. Well, when we get ready to put this on YouTube, you'll uh, get a notice that we're going to do that. And maybe cool. you'll come back on again sometime. Uh, I'd be happy to. I enjoyed it. It's good. Okay. Thank you very I much, Richard. It, I, hope I, I, got the, I hope I answered your questions. Or, or, yes. Very fascinating. Thank you very much. Okay, Cole. Talk to you soon. Bye. Right. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.